Plan for America podcast is a show dedicated to national unity through prosperity that's achieved by free market capitalism. We believe that a rising tide does lift all boats. This show will be positive, solution-oriented, and nonpartisan. Our only agenda is for the prosperity of our country and her people. All are welcome here. This show will not be argumentative or incendiary, sensational or polarizing and divisive. What we are presenting is a positive solution to one of America's greatest problems. Hello and welcome to Plan for America podcast, coming to you from Dynamic Reality Technologies on the campus of Coastal Alabama Community College in Fairhope, Alabama. I'm your host, Eric Nager, and our special guest today is Mr. Johnny Gwynn, who has declared himself a candidate for President of the United States. Welcome, Johnny. Thank you, Eric. I love being on your show. All right. So tell us, first of all, your background, your profession, what prompted you to run for uh, president? Let's start with that. I Okay. Uh, my name is Johnny Gwynn. I uh, am a recovering art director from advertising for 20 years. I own my own ad agency. Um, and now I own Deep Fried Studios, which is a podcast company, which now is a media company. I'm roughly doing live streaming and doing podcasting, where everyone in my eyes should have your own radio type show, your own TV type show, and you're distributing on the internet. And I help people do that. Uh, I have been around politics on the advertising side, but never have run. <clears throat> and there is a podcast called The James Altucher Show, which I highly suggest anyone listen to. And he challenged all of his listeners to run for president to learn the process. I'm very cynical of the election process and government. I have been for many, many years, many elections. And instead of me saying it's not a part of my life, I decided to dive head in and see what it's like to run a actual campaign. Well, you, you're certainly starting at the top. I mean, I, I agree with that premise. I think everyone <laughs> should run for office. I don't know about president, but I think everyone should run for office because it's a great lesson in civics. I had my own experience in that I was appointed to fulfill the unexpired term on the Daphne City Council years ago. And then I ran for that uh, position in, in when the term was up and I lost by 12 votes. <clears throat> but it oh. really, yeah, it really it taught me a lot about <laughs> how the whole process works and presenting yourself. I mean, I went door to door to every single constituent in my district, which you can do uh, at that level, not necessarily um, in a country of 330 million, but at any rate, uh, it, it was a very eye-opening educational experience, and I recommend it for everyone. So the fact you're starting at the top, you know, my, my hat's off to you. So um, <clears throat> are you planning to affiliate yourself with any uh, political party in this endeavor? That, that is a great question. I am actually on uh, my – I'm a registered libertarian. I've been that way okay. for quite a while. If that even is a thing in the state of Alabama, changed their rules so much with party affiliation. <clears throat> Uh, I really I, I definitely uh, the Democratic and Republican Party platforms are very difficult for me. I kind of they either left me or I left them many decades ago. Yeah. And uh, Libertarian Party has its problems. Uh, I'm almost looking to run as a true independent without having a party affiliation at all. It would be easier. Uh, look, I am not in any way believing that uh, I have a chance to uh, challenge a Republican or Democratic candidate. But I went into this with the idea of a learning experience, and then along the way when I was trying to figure out the things I believed in, I said uh, I could use this platform to put things out of saying, hey, here's some things I'd like to change, and I think an independent party would be the best way to do that instead of being locked into a platform is to be able to discuss ideas. All right. Well, li you mentioned Libertarian Party. I just recently met with uh, Spike Cohen, if you know who that is. He was the yeah, Libertarian the vice, president vice candidate. presidential candidate in 2020, and we anticipate having him as a guest on this show. So uh, that'll, that'll be interesting to uh, to get his point of view. But um, um, as an independent, if you do run as an independent, uh, what will your platform be? I mean, what are, what are the key points that you want to uh, emphasize or, or, or see the need for change in? Uh, radical transparency of government, which uh, we were been told for many generations mm -hmm. that we would have. 
I'm really in the idea of really changing the way our currency system works. I am uh, really into cryptocurrency and want us to look into the idea of tokenization and changing our economy in a, a modern direction instead of an old direction. And then the other one too really is I, after the lockdowns, when a group of people were deemed non-essential, I had a very hard time with that classification by the government. And the idea of the business owner should be uh, never non-essential if you are a tax paying person in this country and playing by the rules, you should never be deemed non-essential. I had a very hard time with that. And I really do not like the surveillance state in which we live in. It's getting worse and worse. I don't see it getting better, not only on the state side, but also on the corporate side. So just a few key issues there to, to, uh, to start. Those are, those are yeah. big ones. Those are big ones. So from a practical standpoint, just this, the blocking and tackling of this, if, if, if no one has given this any thought, how do you go about, particularly if you're an independent, mm -hmm getting on the ballot in 50 states because as we know you know a, a national election isn't really a national election it's 50 individual right. state right. elections right so you have to get each state has its own rules to get on the ballot to get the ballot access so people even know you're running what's your plan what's mm -hmm. your process for that what what kind of infrastructure will you need you would have to have a staff of people number one which causes problems because the minute you raise money the government puts a very uh burden upon the small candidate to be able to trace every penny that you take in or give out. Mm -hmm. So immediately you have to have a staff of people to help you run. I've been told by a CPA, for God's sakes, do not take any donations because you go over $5,000 and you're seriously could be go to jail. So infrastructure is very important to have a group of people. I would like to start by trying to get on my own state. You only can do that. I know that is not the idea of wanting national, but you have to have 5,000 signatures to get on the state of Alabama. Um, okay a ballot just to do that is quite the challenge uh i have not put full force into the idea of digital registration all these things for me getting people on my list to get those five thousand. but to me getting on the alabama ballot would be a huge thing in me understanding this process but you are right 50 individual states the end of you have to be a millionaire or billionaire to be able to do it so the idea is uh, why am I running? More of it is the idea of I did it as a lark to begin with, and then I became serious about the idea of I need to take it seriously because this is important. I never sat down and wrote what I actually believed, not only what I could defend, but what I believed is very difficult. So Johnny Gwynn 2024 went from something being a learning and kind of a little thing of me. Uh, uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Skipping the Line in Marketing. It's called Skipping the Line. Run for president. You're going to get a lot of more media attention. You're going to do things. It started out with the idea of me doing that. Now it's the idea of me of saying there are some ideas that I would like to get out. And if I could even get 20, 100, 200,000 people to listen to what I'm saying, uh, that message going out is a start for me to spread ideas, much like your plan from America that uh, I read recently. Yeah. So, well, because again, you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you're talking about changing massive infrastructure and massive precedents, and the idea is, yeah, it's, it's a daunting task, but I guess the idea is saying someone crazy enough says, I'm uh, going to do a website, I'm going to put a thing out, I can use the internet and put out ideas and let me see if other people believe like me, and that's all I can hope for. Just like starting a podcast, I don't believe I'll be Joe Rogan when I start my podcast, but over maybe, maybe eight years, maybe I could be like Joe Rogan, but you have to start by making that first initial thing to be people aware of who you are and what your ideas are. Right. You have, you have to start somewhere. So if someone wants to find out more information about you and your platform, what, what, are, you, what are your websites? What are ways of getting in touch with you if people are interested? I right now have taken down my Johnny2024.com, JohnnyGwen2024.com, because I am reworking uh, my platform. So the website is JohnnyGwen2024.com. And then Johnny Gwen.com is also, you can get to know more about me, but I am still building all my infrastructure for my marketing because it was unclear what I had up before. So it was better to take it down and start up. And I will be rebuilding my website very soon. Okay. So people can look for those domain names and there will be information there in the near future. Right. All right. And, uh, actually, this weekend to get my just basic platform up, which uh, talks about, uh, 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 Capitalism, uh, individualism, uh, peace, tolerance, and um, those bigger things will be on a blog that I'm writing because that needs to be up already just to have the idea of my basic big thoughts of what I think about my platform. All right. And you mentioned uh, capitalism and your concern about corporate surveillance. Um, 
what, what about that? What are your views on capitalism? Uh, free markets for sure, but we know there's manipulation on all sides. The idea is to have less and less government intervention. Uh, free markets do work. I'm really interested in how blockchain is going to change the next 10, 20 years. I don't know if it's going to be money or other things. I know that cryptocurrency and peer-to-peer -peer trading and DeFi is something that's very important. I want to see how that is something we can look at going forward. And at least the idea of saying, please, instead of us talking about regulating innovation in this, in this uh, space, to talk about how we can maybe create innovation in this space with the state and with the corporate side, much like we did with the internet and the 90s and in, in the early 90s where the kind of government kind of stayed out of it and it grew i would like to see us do that with block uh, with blockchain and DeFi. also on a voting thing to look to blockchain also as voting um verification as well and how we can incorporate that safe safely and how it can be the idea of that transparency that i'm talking about that open ledger and the use of the blockchain is something that uh, really scares the heck out of a, a state that likes to have control of authority and their you know use of their authority that, that's an interesting idea you bring up there, and then that may be a solution to the whole idea about election integrity, because there, there's really been some yeah. concern about that. Well, can, you, can, you imagine seeing, can you imagine seeing real-time ledger voting on the blockchain with uh, the idea people can watch it, and the idea there is no manipulation if there is nothing that is hidden? And that I'd like to see how that and look, it's to me when I talk to some blockchain people and some uh, the developers, it almost feels like I am uh, Neo taking the red pill in the Matrix when they <laughs> tell me what that world is like, because uh, I thought I knew the world. And then you realize there's this stuff that's out there that is so groundbreaking and so uh, amazing that is you know, for the people. Uh, uh, with taking control of your finances, taking control of information, that it blows my mind away. And and we and we see a government right now uh, that vilifies this in, this innovation because they know it puts a uh, a scare in the Fed system and the way that money is controlled by banks. That is a very scary to every uh, regime, not just Iran or China, but also to uh, America. And I think that's. That I know watching how scared they are shows me this is some innovative technology that can uh, help the people. Right, right. Oh, on the big tech side, what about the idea of uh, censorship on social media and that kind of stuff? How would you address that? That is very tough because uh, still having libertarian um, leanings very much so, the idea of a private corporation being able to set their own rules is where it gets very tricky and sticky. There is no one answer for that. I am for radical expression. I believe there is nothing you can't say. I like the idea of, uh, of openness. And when someone says something or does something and I see it in public, I can make a decision of that. I like to see the First Amendment protected and extended as far as possible. All right. A good principle. Um, so it sounds like going back to <clears throat> the process of getting on the ballots and everything sounds like 5,000 signatures is not too daunting a task to get onto Alabama. Right. Um, have you yeah, looked at the requirements Florida of other states? Higher. Well, I mean, have you looked at the requirements of other states and what that would take? Yeah. Yes, I actually stopped after the third or fourth uh, state because you're talking about now you're getting to 15,000 in a world that knows me, like doesn't know anything about me. The right. idea is how do you get started? Um, the idea is, you know, 2,000 people run every election for, for, under the president. Uh, there are 2,000 actual candidates. I feel like I'm in that group of people. There's people that run every election. Uh, there's actually a group that meets on Facebook. Once you have actually done the paperwork, you can actually go on and send in a scan, and now you're talking to other candidates that have run in the past on Facebook. Um, I have already run into a snafu when I filled out my FEC one form, which is my statement of candidacy. I didn't read the very fine print at the bottom that said, uh -oh. if you don't turn in FEC form two, which is roughly saying who is handling your money, who is handling your campaign. And I'm putting other people's names down. I had not quite gotten okays from everybody. I did not meet the 10 day FEC two form uh, deadline. So now I'm having to go back through the process of doing FEC form one and now FEC form two. <laughs> so I'm already running into a snafu with my paperwork, but I will say the Fed registration to run for president took less than it did for me to sign up for my Amazon account. It was about four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would imagine. Along the way. 
Yeah, well, I would imagine here in 2021, you're not bumping up against any deadlines for 2024. So, I mean, you're giving yourself plenty of time. Correct. I, and, and I made sure by, uh, I did send a request through the FAQ on the website. If you missed the FE2C deadline and they pretty much said, yes, sir, just reapply. You'll get a new, and I will have a new state. I will have a new federal number, by the way, for a presidential candidate. My new number will be, you know, a 1A77222GWIN. So that was what my old one was, but now All right. a new one. All right. Good to know. Now, nice to know the federal government has me on another list. <laughs> 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 are, are you keeping the option open, though, to be affiliated with the Libertarian Party or some other party so, so you have some infrastructure to help you? Yeah, I really like Dave Smith. He is uh, a comedian who has been uh, on a podcast called The Part of the Problem with Dave Smith while he is a stand-up comedian. He is an incredible Mises Institute disciple, a uh, mm -hmm. Rothbardian, and he mm -hmm. uh, has been very uh, instrumental in me uh, with my, I would say, little – uh, lowercase libertarian, not uppercase libertarian beliefs, being not the party, but more of the Rothbardian kind of side, the Ron Paul world of yeah. uh, how, I mean, me reading Ron Paul in the 90s changed the way I looked at government. It made me look at things different. And I still look at Ron Paul as someone who really is a man of freedom, who was a true independent that was loved by his state that went up, you know, became a Republican eventually, but started out as a yeah. libertarian. Ron Paul still says things today that are as relevant 30 years ago or even more relevant today. And that way of thinking, so Murray Rothbard and Ron Paul really, really, really uh, affect the way that I read and understand how I would like government and the state to work all right well that's a uh, good stop before you're for the moment we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back with johnny gwynn on plan for america podcast if you like what you're hearing and want to learn more about plan for america visit our website at www.planforamerica.us there's an extensive q a section there and if you don't see a question you have then please ask us by email you can order our book Plan for America, How to Place the American Dream on a Sure Foundation Forever that can be found on Amazon.com. You can like us on Facebook. And if you really like what you're hearing, you can, you're welcome to contribute through our website. Plan for America is a nonprofit 501c3 organization, and all contributions are tax deductible. And welcome back to Plan for America podcast. I'm your host, Eric Nager, and our guest is presidential candidate, Johnny Gwynn, who is going to be running in 2024, could be under the libertarian flag, could be under as an independent. He's um, figuring all that out. He's, he's got plenty of time to decide. <clears throat> and I would say you are, you are our first presidential candidate on this podcast. So we're, we're happy to have you here today. Uh, that is a, um, a great honor. Uh, one thing I will say is I am looking at the idea of forming my own party out of the sheer fact of I know uh, the idea of at least a maybe a group uh, momentum will come from that. So where maybe a group would form not like I mean, the Tea Party has a funny kind of uh, the early days of the Tea Party. I was very much for when it was all about finances and uh, financial responsibility. Right. But once everything lumped in the Tea Party, it got kind of. Uh, muddled up and, the, and the, the mission, the focus got kind of a little muddy. Uh, I would like maybe what I'm trying to talk about, uh, maybe a movement could start would be fantastic. Even if I guess said 100 to 200 people on a Facebook group page is a start. Oh, you got to start somewhere. And like we're trying to do with Plan for America. So <clears throat> we've been working on this plan really for quite some time. The podcast just started earlier this year. We now have a, a book out uh, about Plan for America, you know, that's as we're trying to get the word out at the grassroots level. And we really feel it could be a platform on which to run for candidates of any party. It's designed to be a nonpartisan solution. We really believe there are things that a true conservative would like, a true liberal would like, and a true libertarian would like, mm -hmm. because it's not forcing anyone to do anything. It's it's an opt-in system, which which I think a libertarian would like. It um, uh, is has personal responsibility, which I think conservatives would like. It has a single payer health care, which I think a liberal would like. So there, there are aspects of it that uh, hopefully satisfy everyone. The only thing that it does do that some won't like is it takes away power from government. But as I think we've seen, uh, government hasn't always done <laughs> a good job with power. So that's, um, you know, maybe it's time. <laughs> 
that that happens. And it's the only way the government's going to be relieved of 153 trillion with a T of unfunded liabilities, yes. which is which is really one of the greatest threats to our nation today. When it's one of the least talked about, but it's the, one of the most serious because there are bad actors in the world who would love to take over as the leading economy and the leading muscle in the world. And um, you know, put the United States at disadvantage. So we really have to get our financial house in order, and we feel the plan for America is a way to do that. All the other plans we've seen merely tweak the current system. You know, if you talk about means testing or talk about raising retirement yes. ages, all that does is kick the can down the road, and it, it deflates our, or I should say, devalues our daughter in, but through inflation, and. You know, by the time we're ready to retire, Johnny will get paid in you know worthless dollars. Uh, so that, that that's not a solution either. And I, the young people of today get this. They know that Social Security is like a Ponzi scheme, and that they're paying in now. The current retirees are getting the money, and there may not be anything left for them in the future. So, Plan for America, just as a quick setup, is it's an opt-in system. We want to enable it by legislation, but then also contract law, because that's harder to change in legislation. Legislation can be changed from one party to another. Contract law is harder yeah. to change. So the contract is among the federal government, the state governments, and a private trust to be established by the plan called For America Security Trust or the FAST. Once that's set up, every U.S. citizen can opt in. It's not mandatory, but you can opt in. And if you opt in, then the 15.3% of your payroll taxes, instead of going to the government to fund Social Security and Medicare, goes to a private account in your name that will be invested mm -hmm. in an all market index of U.S. domiciled publicly traded companies. So there is clear transparency. It, that would be almost costless to administer, and you'd be harnessing uh, free market capitalism. What, what are your thoughts on on that broad outline of a plan? I, I like the basis of taking it out of the hands of going into an escrow account that the government sits on for, for forever, and now the person can now take responsibility for it. Now, your fund being based on American stocks, publicly traded stocks, yes, might not be what I would say because I would like to look at other <clears throat> forms of what I can do with that 15% that you're giving me, more control of that. But a step in the direction of taking it away from the big beast, which is the government, would be so hard to do because of so much power that they're giving up. Um, I love the idea of the person being able to take charge of their own account. And then who is the – but who is in uh, the oversight of the, of the fund? Well, because it's an index, there really is no uh, picking of winners and losers. There would be five trustees of the trust that the people would elect. Uh, so, you know, but but the, the trust has no power. The yeah, trustees have government. no power to decide to direct the money or put it anywhere. And the thing we like, the reason we picked equities, you bring up a great point, is because this would make every U.S. citizen who participates in the trust a stakeholder, an owner of corporate America. All of a sudden, yeah. you're harnessing the yeah. so-called Wall Street fat cats to be employees of the little guy, the common ordinary citizen. Yeah. And then everyone... That doesn't work. Yeah. Go ahead. I love the idea of, of, <clears throat> of encouraging people to participate in. Now you've got skin in the game in the American in the American companies. Uh, one of the things that I and this is real uh, a blue sky level type thinking about uh, of what got me into the presidential idea was the idea of putting a valuation on what your citizenship actually is worth. The idea of what is an American citizen? What is your worth? What is that? When people uh, go and they say, I am no longer, they denounce your citizenship, what are they actually giving up? Well, we have a world of apathy that says, who gives a crap if I'm an American citizen, right? But if you're invested in the business side of it with your plan, and then you, my idea of appraising what American citizenship is worth with a dollar amount that people understand, now you will hold it as being precious. Now you will take care of it. You might care if there are things that get in the idea of you voting and what your citizenship actually means. At that point, if is your citizenship a stock at that point? Roughly, you're holding stock in a company. Would you want to devalue the stock by people coming in? 
more people coming in dilutes the value of how many stocks or shares are out there. Then you start thinking in an immigration, much less in a more moral or maybe political position. Now you're thinking the idea of an economic position. You can at least, I'm not saying you say you don't want to do it, but you need to look at it in a different way that everybody understands as money. Your plan for America comes to the point of America can't control its spending problem. It can't control it. We're getting worse and worse every year. We're moving into monetary. Um, I think we're moving into uh, money, um, um, modern mon uh, monetary theory, which is them just printing whatever they want. And at that point, why even tax us at all if you can print what you want? I don't see it getting better of getting our house in line. I see it getting worse with the state of getting our house in line. And unless the people stand up and not only have their money, but all money in control. I don't know how we stop the spending. Uh, we're junkies spending money in this country. We can't stop the people that spend. Well, that, that's exactly why this plan has been put forth is to, to <laughs> reverse that decline of, of the spending in the U.S. dollar, the value of the dollar, and, and putting people in charge, uh, as, as you point out. We think this would skyrocket the value of U.S. citizenship because not only does this come with the retirement plan, which is a legacy in perpetuity, by the way. Yes. One of the provisions of the plan is that once you pay, well, the payout starts in your retirement phase, it continues even after your death to your heirs in perpetuity, which is something that Social Security does not do. Social Security ends when you pass or your spouse passes. So this goes on forever. So it's a legacy for everyone. Also comes with high quality, affordable healthcare plan for every U.S. citizen. So that's another thing that greatly values U.S. citizenship. And, you know, before COVID pandemic era budget deficits that the government's running now, prior to that, when we were running merely, you know, trillion dollar or less annual deficits, one of our studies showed that if Social Security and Medicare are taken off the government's plate, then you can have a basically a balanced federal budget almost immediately and not have to deficit spend. The other thing to keep in mind is that the Social Security Trust Fund is really bankrupt now. The only thing in it right now is non-negotiable government IOU. So it's not like there's money in there now that's going to last to the 2030s. It's really already been spent. So these are these are things that uh, need to be brought out, and neither party seems to be bringing it up. Uh, is that <clears throat> not the third rail in politics? You it don't is. want to talk, talk, talk Social Security, which is the biggest thing we need to be talking about, yet you can't talk about it. Hence the problem of the corrupt system that you write about in your uh, paper, in your plan for America. The system is – there needs to be a systematic washout of the way we look at how we are governed and how we spend money. And the problem is not only wonderful plans like yourself, but we have to actually not revise the system. We almost have to crush it and start back. I don't know how we do that. Great ideas are great ideas, but to let people who are used to power and money being a big power um, mm -hmm. weapon – how do you get them to let go of that power when they want to – the very nature of the state is to grab more and keep it? Well, I think the short answer to that question is you create a system where there are more goodies for everyone than in the current system. So, for example, yeah. here, your, your market returns over time would be way better than Social Security. We're talking about better quality health care. People are going to want to, to opt into the system. By the way, one of the provisions of the contract is that your contributions to your retirement plan are tax deductible going in and tax free coming out. So that's also mm -hmm. better than Social Security. Um, the government gets out of 153 trillion plus of unfunded liabilities, which there is no way to get out from under that right now. That's the trade off. I mean, if they, yes, they have to give up a little bit of power. But to get a clean slate and to have the debts eventually wiped away, it won't happen overnight, but over time it will. And then um, they can function and uh, defend us and do the other basic functions of government that are necessary to be done. Correct. The ones I actually kind of agree with, the ones that you're talking about, defending the borders, having a military, uh, unfortunately, they're necessary evils that we have to have. But the social programs… You know, I, I was doing some research on the history of Social Security. It was not meant to be a long-term entitlement, yet it's still sitting there and getting worse and worse. Um, I, I am very cynical to the future of uh, the economic uh, path that we are on in this country. I don't want to be one of those Dr. Dooms, the uh, the you know the people that were the Rabinis that were calling for what was going to happen in 2008. 
but a lot of those people are still stand, sounding this alarm that makes me almost feel like Mad Max Thunderdome time is coming. Yeah. And that really, really makes me incredibly nervous. Luckily, we live in a part of the world that gets buffered from a lot of that. Uh, the South, uh, we are tend to be two or three years, maybe this is anecdotal, uh, maybe you agree with me or not, we tend to be two or three years behind the rest of the country in the way that finance is kind of like, we don't get the big boom on the front end, but we don't actually get popped on the back end because we kind of had this buffer zone of a two, three year time. Hopefully we see things coming and can personally personally ourselves control our financial issues when I think systematically that American dollar and that American economy is going to have a very bumpy ride the next decade. Well, it will in absence of a plan like this. It doesn't necessarily have to be planned for America. We don't know of any other plan like this out there right now. Um, but anyway, we, we want to get the word out that uh, it is a viable alternative and um, people who are running for office can uh, espouse it because can ask for it. Not, it doesn't belong to anyone. I mean, we're, 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 it's out there in the marketplace of ideas. So um, that's, yeah. that's well, and that's what I love. One of the things that I love is you shared it with me. Now I am digesting it. I'm thinking about some things that I'm thinking e economics are probably the number other than the, other than the individualism and, you know, uh, freedom. Uh, the business side is very important to the way I look at uh, the world these days. Uh, I want to read more economists to understand making decisions on a um, on a ledger more so than with my heart is very helpful. And uh, your ideas put things out there that says, let's talk about some real uh, pros and cons on the idea of policy and then the idea of dollars and cents. And like I said, if we can't have those discussions on math, we are really in trouble. So I appreciate you putting out ideas. My question to you is, have you looked at the world of cryptocurrency and the idea of tokenization in your plan at all? Have not looked at it in, in context of the plan. Yeah, not it would be interesting because I would love to be able to. Yeah, yeah, right. But I would love, my thing is I'd love to take a certain portion of that 15% and be able to put it in new technology and, and well in an exchange that was, it would be huge because I, I really believe that it's the like it or not, that is going to be the future of our financial systems. It's going to be some form of more digital, less form of analog. Could well be. Johnny, uh, yep. great having you as a guest here. Anything else you'd like to add right at the end? Yes, uh, I would love to hear from anybody at johnnygwen.com or johnnygwen 2024com uh, and I want to, in, uh, things that really drive you crazy about uh, our country. I know that sounds silly and rant, please rant to me because I want to get more of a taste of, uh, am I the only one who feels uh, as little cynical as I am or is it, a, uh, is it a general feeling out there and what are people thinking about and worried about in the next uh, eight years? Well, be careful what you ask for, Johnny. That, that's my response to that, <laughs> but uh, you may get a few rants. But Don't I'm call me. <laughs> Don't call me. Email me, please. That, okay. That's more of a, a safer way of taking rants. <laughs> All right. Uh, fair enough. That's good. Well, we really appreciate being a guest today. Join us next time for another edition of Plan for America podcast. If you like what you're hearing and want to learn more about Plan for America, visit our website at www.planforamerica.us. There's an extensive Q&A section there. And if you don't see a question you have, then please ask us by email. You can order our book, Plan for America, How to Place the American Dream on a Sure Foundation Forever. That can be found on Amazon.com. You can like us on Facebook. And if you really like what you're hearing, you can, you're welcome to contribute through our website. Plan for America is a nonprofit 501c3 organization and all contributions are tax deductible.